There is a tiger. This is her home territory where we're putting you. She has some cubs. She's killed 22 people this year. But it's okay, she's only eaten 12 of them. Okay, well then that's great, my odds are good. Hey, I'm Les Stroud, also known as Survivor Man, and this is The Breakdown. This is Into the Wild. This kind of frantic sort of crawling around behavior, that is accurate. At home, we might want to run to a bathroom or run outside, but in his state, malnutrition, starvation, dehydration, even that right there. You'd think you could drink water to make it feel better, but when you have poison in your stomach, even water in your mouth is going to feel like poison. It's going to feel painful. And so him actually not swallowing the water was spot on. The thing about trying to identify wild edible plants through books, you could have nine books in front of you with photographs and line drawings and descriptions. You will just never ever be 100% certain. There is only one way to learn wild plants, and that's to have a teacher there showing you. When somebody says to you, yes, pick it, oh, go ahead and eat it. Oh, you're too shy? Okay, here, I'll show you. See, as soon as you see somebody else put it in their mouth, you go, Okay, I guess it's all right. When you start to learn what an edible wild plant is, you start to pay attention to all of the nuances of plant morphology. The leaves, are they spiked? Are they smooth? Are they basal? Are they around the stem? There's all these different descriptions and that's what he's doing right here. Oh, lateral veins, and then you hold it up and you look, are they lateral, are they vertical? It's tricky to do that. To this day, I will probably not taste test a plant until I've been able to find somebody that knows. I'm doing mushroom season and I go out with friends. I go out with guys who really know their mushrooms to know that I'm getting the right one. In the case of wild edible plants, most poisonous plants will just make you sick, maybe make you vomit, but we're dealing with an individual who's already starving. If he'd had a, a larder full of food, then even eating the wrong plant would have made him sick for a day or two. That's it. And he would have recovered. This is gonna come back as a refrain, the use of the grizzly bear. When you start to get into states of starvation, things become very surreal, which is why when this bear showed up, I wasn't sure if this was supposed to be a dream. The concept of a bear like that just walking by is, no, that's not gonna happen. The likely case scenario is the bear is not going to come close. It's going to, more than anything, stay away from him and his bus. I think Sean Penn handled the confusion of the wild edible plants and the books and the identifying very well because it is confusing. And the bottom line, the moral of the story, don't do it. Don't eat it if you don't know 100%. Bigger scale, my opinion, of Chris, I think he was probably a very wonderful man. A lot of people liked him. He's been deified almost at this point, but he was a terrible survivalist. He didn't know anything. Oh no, but he had all those experiences. Where if you really pay attention and check out his story, the truth is he always got out of things by somebody else pulling him out. Somebody always kind of helped him out of bad situations. When he got up to Alaska, there was nobody there to save him. He was probably a very charming, very well-spoken man. Alaska doesn't give a crap if you're charming. I don't believe Chris had to die. I think with a few bits of knowledge, he could have gotten by there. He could have done things much differently. I know in the story, he has a moose and it spoils on him. There were so many ways he could have had that moose last him the entire time he was there, but he, did, he just simply didn't know how to do it. This is The Edge. This is one of those films, I purposely didn't watch it based on the poster alone. Imagine you are a lawyer, or your partner is a doctor, and they make a TV show out of it. You know, you sit there going, no! That's what I do when it comes to survival films. If it's really that cold, I know he's got a little bit of the hand up to the mouth thing. The thing that you want to protect the most is actually your head. 80% of your heat is lost through your head. I mean, I'm bald. And so for me, a cap in the wintertime is just vital. Otherwise I really lose heat. Okay, right there. Do you see any footprints of him walking up to that spot? Because I don't see any. This is when Hollywood just doesn't get it. All of that snow around him, that should be all mucked up. It's like he was placed there by the, the camera crane or something. Here, we're gonna put you down there and then we're gonna film the scene. 
a grizzly bear of that size can sneak up on you that quickly and that silent. I don't know which bear this is in, in Hollywood terms. It's probably Bart. Bart the bear is a famous bear used in so many films. Nicely groomed bear, by the way. What we're about to see is a bear attack and a very silly one. When that grizzly is going to come after you, they run full steam, super fast, much faster than you can. And a lot of times their back two legs, they'll go in unison because they're really pushing at it. And so what we have here is an acting bear lollygagging along behind him, frolicking in the snow. Here's a tip here. The real thing to do in the case of a grizzly bear attack is to play dead. The way I look at predators, we have what I think are accidental predators and apex predators. An apex predator are those creatures on this planet that truly would like to eat us. Great white shark would truly like to eat us, not because we're prey or they want to find us or anything like that, but because they're kind of haphazard eaters, they'll, they'll taste test stuff. But the way you react to a predator is going to be different each time. With a grizzly, you don't stand a chance. Can't outrun it. One thing you can do to a grizzly bear is bore them. They may taste test you while they're getting bored, which means you might have to put up with a chomped hand or something, but you keep all the extremities in and you curl up into a ball and you get boring and you play dead. That said, would you or I run? Damn straight we'd run. <laughs> I'd probably run too. I could sit here and say I should play dead, but I'd be like, maybe there's a chance. <laughs> a bear like that is not going to run through those trees snapping them over. What's going to happen is they're all green and growing and young. They're all going to bend and be pushed to the side. These things are snapping like dry toothpicks that have been standing there for 20 years dead. You know what, I guess I could throw a little kudos here to one thing. If you are going to protect yourself from an animal that big, getting in a grove of trees or a jumble of big branches like that, that actually is a smart thing to do. Just a little behind the scenes magic, Bart the bear and the other acting bears, they never growl. When a grizzly bear growls, he truly is angry. These guys are trained actors. They've taught the bear to just hang their mouth open or even open their mouth with all the saliva and the fangs. In reality, there's zero sound coming out of their mouth. They have to dub all that in later. He's a man killer. Oh, that's a pet peeve. He's a man killer. Oh my gosh. We've been fed that for a lot of years. Even back in the days of uh, the movie Born Free. And is that tiger a man eater? Or is it just enacting its own survival? He's been following us the whole time. He's stalking us. The torches. If you can have a safe and massive fire, I'm talking like six feet flames, do it. When they start throwing these torches, those torches are treated by the special effects unit so that they will not blow out as they throw them in the air. I've thrown lots of burning logs in the air. Sometimes they stay going. Most of the times they snuff out while they're flying. Classic Hollywood. The grizzly bear growling off in the distance. That will happen with cats, not so much bears two guys, the fire, all of that, the bear's just gonna take off running. They're not gonna hover around the outside growling. But we always see them in Hollywood films growling, like, yeah, oh, I'll get you. This is 127 hours. That's really true to course. When you're that dehydrated, even a sprinkle of rain, you're out there running around trying to catch the drops. This is a really nice depiction of flash flooding. I've seen rivers go up 20 feet in a matter of a couple of hours. My canoes were about to get washed downstream. You can imagine how fast that is. And that's the danger of flash floods. They don't have to happen where you are. They just ha have to happen uphill from where you are. The thing about this is Aaron Ralston, who the film was made about, is an incredibly experienced adventurer. Even though this is a dream sequence, the depiction of the reality on his face of what's going on water-wise is, is very real. People who do a lot of this kind of adventuring can recognize the signs, and he knows he's in a crevice that has a thousand crevices leading to it, and every single one of those crevices is about to become a stream. That's the crazy part about a flash flood. You have to see it to believe it, because it's not like, oh, well, we got time, let's walk out of the way, let's go up higher. Man, walls of water coming down the crevice, 15 to 20 feet high. You try to get out of the way of that. And of course, he's trapped. A little nuance that I like, they didn't have him calling for help. So often the scene in the film is already hopeless. It gets worse and then they start calling for help. It's like you haven't had help for 12 hours. All of a sudden you think someone's gonna come now because you're yelling. And that's the cool part. This is when rocks and big trees and logs get moved around. It's possible that this water could have given that kind of buoyancy and that force and push on the rock to move it so that in his dream, he pulls his hand out. I have to be careful, but I don't have to be careful. Um, some of these films are made on real stories. So that one clearly is. That's Aaron Ralston's story, the 127 hours. The one thing during that movie I wanted to talk with him about was drinking his own pee for dehydration. And the reality is, no, that's a, that's a no-go. Like, no, you do not do that in a survival situation. I think, in truth, what he really felt was a, was a sense of comfort. He wasn't necessarily hydrating himself, 
even though it's 92% water, but there's all the toxins and so on. But here's the missing link. Most of the time when you're that dehydrated, you don't pee. This is The Office, an episode actually called Survivor Man. Producers contacted me and said, Michael Scott's gonna go out and try to be you. I couldn't have been more honored. It, this is the highlight of my career. I've got the DVD at home. It's sitting on my shelf, you can bet. It's funny how right Steve Carell got things. Now this way, I can't retrace my steps. I don't know what streets we've been. Ow! Yeah, I did that. I blindfolded myself and I had them paddle me into the swamp. His mimicking of me is so embarrassingly spot on. I was like, God, am I that cheesy? Am I that bad? Please allow me to have one cathartic experience in my life. There's a lot of weekend warriors that want to have exactly what Michael just said. They want to have a cathartic experience playing Survivor Man. I will remain close by to provide unseen moral support, <laughs> but I will never help him. That happened to me. I've had my crew go, are you sure, Les? Can we just like check in on you? I've had to argue with my crew. If you go to do something like this, a lot of times the people around you, they just, they won't let you. In the Arctic, my, one of my very first episodes, I had a, a hunter that watched me from afar through his gun sights. In the Amazon jungle, I had a, a native elder. He kept showing up. I'm in the middle of the jungle and I'm like, oh, catching some shrimp and I'm filming. I'm doing this, I'm doing what Michael Scott's doing and I'm talking to the camera and I look over and he's standing there. And he's just wanting to make sure that I'm okay. Now everything, I brought with me can be used. The stupid part about this is it's gonna be hard for me to critique this because he's copying a Survivor Man episode and he's kind of getting it right. So many episodes of mine I can't watch anymore because I'm doing something really stupid like that. In the Cook Islands, I cut off the bottom of my shirt to make a bandana. It was just super cool and stupid. But. This can be used for all sorts of things. Okay, in a real survival situation, what you would do is you try to not damage anything that you have unless you can repurpose it for something better. Then you don't want to be squeamish about damaging something. Totally alone right now, with only my thoughts. I love it. I'm loving it. When you're alone out there, you do some really silly stuff. It's cathartic. If you're distraught, you might break down and bawl your eyes out. If you're angry, remember that argument you had three days ago in the airport on the way here? You, I can't believe that she said that. Da -da. You get it all out when you're out there. You know, he made a mistake cutting his pant legs off and then he had to fix a mistake. When you're super hot at 2 p.m., you think everything's gonna be fine. And then at 5.30, you're like, huh. And now you're wishing you hadn't soaked your shirt in the lake or, or something, or in his case, cut his pant legs off. I'll tell you what bugs me halfway through a Survivor Man episode. My crew, leave me alone for my seven days. And I know that on the day three, when I'm really hungry, they're having a beer and a filet mignon. I have made this spear. Ridiculously embarrassing. I made a spear that wasn't much straighter than that in the Cook Islands one time, and I knew it wasn't gonna work, but I had to do something, I had to try. Well, you know what you eat when you're, when you're out there? Very little, little grubby things. That's why, you know, I highlight catching a scorpion or crickets or something like that. That's what you really get. Nobody runs and impales a rabbit. You don't accidentally come upon a, a zebra that you can just eat because it's laying there in Africa with nobody touching it. On survival, you grovel. I have been without food for a good three hours or so. Now that's hilarious. If my kids say to me after two hours after lunch, oh dad, I'm starving. It's like, you realize you've got the wrong father to say I'm starving too. People think that three hours, six hours without food and they're going to perish. Three days and you're still pretty lucid and okay in without water. With food, you'll get lethargic, but you got 10 days of still being able to do things without eating. It's Creed's birthday today. Happy birthday to you. There's a lot of moments just like that. Not singing happy birthday, just sitting there. <sighs> okay, you have to get your mind together. You have to think about what you're gonna do next. It's actually a good thing. The truth about survival and a survival situation and filming it is that real survival is really boring. You hardly do anything. If you think about it, I'm out there for seven days, you've got a 43 minute episode that you watch. That's 43 minutes across seven days. A lot of that time, nothing's happening. That's the truth and reality of a real survival situation. It's not wham, bam, thank you ma'am, full of packed action. You're just kinda sitting there singing happy birthday. This is Life of Pi. I read the book, but I read the book after I saw the movie. You know, I don't know what it is, the difference between filmmakers when they try to depict certain scenes that actually happen in life. Some just do a silly job of it. Others nail it and they make you feel every moment. And this is one of those films where you can feel that door opening underwater and the pressure difference, everything. So far, so good.
When frantic scenes like this happen, it's a very difficult thing to get right. You can take the camera and jostle it around like you're the character. Or you can slam it into walls and things, but too often Hollywood shows the, the missteps and the slips as ridiculously dramatic, which is fine if you're watching The Avengers. But if you're watching something like this, you know, you want it to be pretty spot on to how someone would slip on the deck, how someone would catch themselves. What I love about this scene is how quickly the boat slips away from the main boat. When the storm is that crazy, you can be out of reach of your safety within a split second. I'll bet you in the brain it all happens in slow motion but in real life, it happens this fast. With waves like that, uh, you're going to be tossed about. You're nothing more than a cork, really. I think they depicted him being at the mercy of being tossed from a ship, as perfect as I can imagine it, anyway. Your voice can only carry so far. I've been a, on the other side of a river with some basic rapids, not even rushing rapids, and you yell and the person on the other side can't hear you. Your voice does not cut through storms and rain and wind and forest very well at all. Whistles do. That's why whistles matter in survival. They cut through the sound, they travel long distance a lot better than you yelling help. It's one of the reasons why I taught myself how to whistle. If I would whistle right now, I'd blow the microphones out. Now that little moment right there is very true. I've been in the ocean with crazy waves trying to get on board small vessels. It is often a wave that will get you on board. When you know them, you can kind of time it. You know, the boat's going up eight feet and down eight feet. You have to time getting on board that boat with the waves. So, the tiger did it right. There's a few things going on here. Number one, him jumping ship. It's a fictional story, so I can't even speak to that one. Seeing the immensity of the wave above him, that's a pretty real thing to see. Going down below like this, the, the, the instant quiet, that's one of the things I love about diving. It could be crazy, but once you go underneath the surface, it just goes quiet. They did throw in sharks swimming by for dramatic effect, and that's all that is, is dramatic effect. Yeah, nicely and beautifully done. I don't know if he's a free diver, but you can get down that low. You can hover, and I've done it watching humpback whales. This particular scene, they did beautifully in Life of Pi. This is open water. I've done a lot of shark dives. I highly advise learning how to dive and diving with sharks. It's one of the most amazing things you'll ever do in your life. They're set up here. People have been forgotten. With different companies, like companies I don't know, especially local companies in small countries, I worry. And they go out with 25 people, 26 people, and they don't do a head count. You don't, you're not paying attention to anybody else. You're looking at your own gear, and you're, you know, with your wife or your husband or your partner. Oh, oh my God. What is it? I won't comment on the acting, but as far as the scene goes, this is how sharks operate. Curious at first, so they'll bump you. They might bump you another six times. A tiger shark might try to taste test the tank on your back. More testing of what these two things up there are by the sharks before an all out attack. It has happened. A shark has come out of nowhere and attacked a diver before. That has happened. So rare compared to the amount of hours that humans are in the water doing all of this, these activities. Beautiful shark. Okay, are you okay? It actually does portray how he would probably react to that because you get angry when, when you get hurt, or at least I do. In fact, friends of mine know that if I get hurt and I go silent, I'm really hurt. But if I'm swearing up a storm, no, nah, he'll be fine, he's, you know. Now, right there, that big chunk out of his leg, would a shark do that on a second bump? Highly unlikely. Except for the great white, most of the sharks are accidental predators. They may attack because of other reasons things are going on. You know, I mean, spear fishermen get attacked a lot because they've got dead fish all over them. My leg is still there, right? Yeah, I can feel it. Bad scripting. My leg is still there, right? The shark going after that little beacon there, it's been proven that sharks are actually attracted to the color yellow. Think about that when you buy your next wetsuit. And so the shark bumping that, I don't necessarily think the director meant that to be biologically correct, but it, it accidentally was, let's say. She's about to put a tourniquet on. What a controversial subject. The pendulum has always swung the use of a tourniquet in a survival situation. For a while it was use a tourniquet, then it was never use a tourniquet, and it was use a tourniquet, and it was never use a tourniquet. We're back to pretty much using a tourniquet if you've been given the proper instructions. So the idea with using a tourniquet is you learn how to do it properly just as you would get your CPR or your first aid training. So putting a tourniquet on him is a smart thing to do. Now I would have gone top of my thigh, just higher, just in the crux there. Nonetheless, it's still the right thing to do. Oh, One of the most painful things you can ever feel in your life is a tourniquet. It hurts more than the shark bite. The first time I ever panicked under the water, my dive instructor took my head and held it like that. And then she went like this. 
and she just calmed me down. And that's what's going on in this scene. She's kind of doing the right thing. In a survival situation with that much panic, would there be more sharks? Uh, you bet there would be. They can smell, I can't remember the statistic. It's one of those crazy statistics like a drop of blood in a million gallons of water or something like that. There are going to be different things you can do. Sharks are like cats. They do not want to attack you from the front. So, I mean, in India, I wore a mask on the back of my head so that a tiger wouldn't pounce on me from behind. In the water, when I see sharks, you wanna make eye contact with a shark. Sharks don't want to attack your face. If I were her, I would've gone and just kept looking. Just make sure the shark knows you know it's there. The answer to where you should go to save yourself lies entirely in what preparation did you do before this? What do you know? Do you know that you are two miles west from a whole archipelago? Do you know that you're a quarter mile east of a very large island? Do you know that? Do you know the currents? Get all the information about what you're, the hike you're about to do in Peru, the dive you're about to go on. All of that information should be in your head, not just the guide's head. Because what happens when you lose the guide? You want to know, where did you leave from the boat? How far out are you? Can you make an attempt to swim to safety? Because I certainly would want to. And if the guide doesn't want to give you information, you need to stop that trip right there. This is Alive. If we do this, we'll never be the same again. It's like communion. From their death, we live. People will understand. I know this story very, very well. And I can assure you that the decision to engage in cannibalism is not one you come by easily. If I have you for three days or four days with no food and I show you that we can eat scorpions and creepy crawlies and I eat one in front of you, you're not gonna hesitate. Give me some of those and you're gonna eat. Cannibalism, total different thing. This should be good for the cutting. Classic show of leadership here. That blank stare from everybody. These people thought they were going to be damned to hell. Some of these people struggled well after their ordeal. I believe the Pope even absolved them and assured them that they were still going to heaven. I mean, wow, the psychological kickback from all this has been intense. So I hate to be technical about it, but glutamus maximus. If you're going to engage in cannibalism, that's where all the meat is. Boy, I don't mean any disrespect. The reality is that the glutes are the most exposed, easiest thing to get. Anything else requires precision like surgery of going in and maybe getting organs and things like that. I mean, and think about how horrifying to say, you know what, we should eat the liver first. Ah. What you do in a situation of cannibalism is you try to dehumanize the body laying in front of you. An animal that you catch can be, at one moment, a cute and cuddly rabbit. And then when it's dead, it's a piece of meat you need to skin and roast. That's what they psychologically have to do. They have to take a look at the biggest muscle on the body, the place that is the farthest away from the humanism, the face. This is extreme survival. There's no question about it. I get asked, where's the toughest place to survive? What I'll say is, wherever it's cold. If it's cold, it's hard. You can't stop. If I'm in a really rugged area and there's jaguar around and poisonous things, but it's 75 degrees, I'm okay. I got forgiveness time. I can sleep by a tree maybe. When it's cold, you can succumb so quickly to hypothermia. When you don't have food in your system, what's there to keep your body engine warm? When it comes to cannibalism and any survival situation, you and I cannot judge. A group of people on the verge of potentially never being rescued and potentially dying are having to make a decision like this. So you can't judge unless you're there. Jeremiah Johnson. My favorite movie of all time. The uh, consultant on this film was uh, none other than Larry Dean Olson, one of the godfathers of survival. What follows are proper depictions of, of survival. And first little slice of realism is that this is the time of year when the fish run in creeks like that. I've been in creeks with all the snow around and, and suckers are just running like crazy, bouncing off your legs. Now you might be asking, why would he get himself all wet like that? Well, he's a desperate mountain man looking for sustenance. He's going after fish. Well, actually, no, this was an accidental find. He was trying to trap, but he sucks at it. This is the very beginning of the film. And this is the thing, we think we, we can just go up there and just be Jeremiah Johnson. You have to train, you have to learn these skills. If you're going to try and catch fish in a creek, even when there's hundreds of them, it can be tricky. I thought maybe they're just busy about their business until I started doing it several times. Oh no, they know you're there. They swim away from you quickly. Why? Because you represent to them likely a grizzly bear. Anything big that's coming down along the water, they don't want to be around it. So they try to take off. So it's very difficult. Now what we're seeing here is going to set up the entire movie, which is his friendship with and then war with tribes that were in the area. That's a good look of disgust right there. Now later on in the film, actually when he bumps into that native leader again through translation, he says, you fish poorly. 
uh, and he did. We're not looking at a seasoned mountain man yet. He's a wannabe. This scene here, I love this fire scene because, again, I know that Larry Dean Olson was consulting, showing him this is how it actually works. With rock and steel and charred cloth, you take 100% cotton and you char it. And then if you put a spark on it, it catches the spark, holds the ember, you put that in tinder, you blow it to flame. That was their pack of matches. That's not like rubbing two sticks together, which is even more primitive. Doing it with the fire bow is, goes back in time. Doing it with your hands goes even farther back in time in different geographical locations. The thing about getting a fire going is this. You've got to humble yourself and really take your time. I still don't understand today in regular camping how people can't get a fire going with matches and dry wood. It just it baffles me. In the end, it's a skill set and one worth practicing, and he's about to blow it. What's he done wrong? He's got no protection around him. He's not out of the wind. Doesn't have a big supply of wood beside him. You have to treat your fire like it's your baby. If you can do that, you, you'll, you will get a great warm fire going. The thing that Jeremiah Johnson portrays beautifully is that the romanticism and the power of being out in the mountains or on horseback or in the wilderness alone is still very, very powerful. It's a, it's a soul experience. I guarantee you, every man that has seen this movie is playing Jeremiah Johnson in his head when he, when he watches I Could Do That. Yeah. The thing about Jeremiah Johnson and his ability to live and survive in the wilderness is um, he's just not instantly good at it. It takes a long time. It comes down in the end, he's on the mountainside and he's comfortable and he's roasting a rabbit. The character he meets in the beginning looks at him and just says, you've come far, pilgrim. My favorite line of all time, he just, without even uh, barely look at him, he just says, feels like far. That encapsulates the journey of wilderness survival. It takes a long time, and when you get to the end of it, it doesn't feel like it went by fast. It does feel like it's been a, a long journey. You know, sometimes like, boy, that went right by. Not survival, not wilderness. You get to the end of it, you feel weathered, you feel tough, and you feel like you've been on a, on a long journey. That was my breakdown. Thanks for watching.